sometimes wonder where is this going, I will guarantee you there are no wasted words. Okay? I don't have time to waste. I don't want to waste your time. Uh, so what did we look at yesterday? Uh, what I'd like you to think of now is three marriages. One is Hosea and the woman he married, Gomer. Another one is God and the woman he married, is Israel. And the third one is Jesus and the woman he married, and that's you. Okay, if you keep those parallels in mind, you will begin to really get into the essential uh, of this book. And the astonishing fact is that Jesus loves you so much, he has written a proposal of marriage. And he said, I want to spend eternity with you. I know all there is to know about you. You don't have any secrets. I know who you are. I want to spend eternity in a relationship with you. And I am writing out a declaration of my love for you in my own blood from Calvary. Okay, so that's the background to everything we're going to say. And you might wonder, <laughs> what does this got to do with that? Well, it does. But you sometimes have to wait to find out because there's the impact of surprise when finally things connect and make sense. But you've got to wade through some of the details before you get there. Okay? Now, I want you to turn, if you would please, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, one of the best-known parts of Scripture. Storm here. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Ooh, how can you do that? Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? When he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What do we learn so far? The Jews look for any excuse to have a party. <laughs> and heaven is a big party. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. 
But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother was angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Jesus only had three years in public ministry, and of course, he spent a good bit of it with 12 guys, training them. And even when he was in public, he was still training them. But he had a few hours in conflict. And his conflict was with the establishment. The establishment was religious, very religious. Founded, apparently, on God's word. They taught it was the only education they had. Every boy was versed in the Old Testament. The girls didn't have school, but they probably picked it up along the way. And they prided themselves on being God's chosen people. <coughs> God was kind of disappointed in their response because their relationship wasn't with him just with the word. And if the word doesn't bring you to him, he's left disappointed. And he is now in conflict because his lifestyle doesn't suit the establishment. This, they thought of holiness as what you don't do. You know, you don't get into fights, you don't get drunk, you don't go with prostitutes, and you don't associate with yucky people. And therefore you're holy. That was their thinking. Holiness is not what you don't do, it's what you do do. <clears throat> and they have this conflict with Jesus because he's doing everything that they think is what you shouldn't do. And particularly, the company he keeps. Thieves, prostitutes, all kinds of disgusting people. And he didn't just associate with them, he ate with them. And in Jewish culture, eating with somebody implies acceptance. It implies you're one with these people. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him. Astonishing thought. So the Pharisees are getting in little holy huddles and muttering, this man eats with Sinners, Ugh, how can he do this? He can't be holy. 
So Jesus tells a story, and then he tells another story, and then he tells another story. <coughs> All in the same theme, but there's a progression. The shepherd, he has a hundred sheep, and he loses one. Well, if he's got a hundred, he can afford to lose one. Uh, he doesn't want to, and he isn't going to, but one in a hundred is not that much, and it's just a sheep, and it'll be somebody's roast dinner in a couple of months anyway. Well, it's a big deal. <coughs> and yet, it's familiar in their country. It's an excuse for a party. But before that, you've got a long search to find the thing because sheep have a great propensity to get lost. My nearest neighbor in Ireland has 4,000 of them, so I have lots of uh, illustrations. And many of them like to get lost in my garden <laughs> and eat the things that are most precious to me and least nutritious for them. <coughs> I have some experience of sheep. They get lost easily, and they aren't easily found. And it's dangerous country where there are bandits and mountain lions, dangerous for the sheep, dangerous for the shepherd to go looking for them. But he goes and finds them. Everybody identified. Yeah, we know this. So he said, well, then there's this lady, and she had ten coins. And these ten coins would be her dowry. They would be given to her when she got married. They are a special symbol, kind of like uh, a Western woman's wedding ring. And for some reason, that is seriously important. And if a woman loses her wedding ring or her engagement ring, She's going to look for it. <laughs> oh, yes, she's going to look for it. My wife's lost hers five times. I know she's going to look for it. <clears throat> so she looks at when she finds it, there's a celebration. There's joy. Yeah, we understand this. We do this. Now there's a father. He has two sons. And you've gone down from 100 sheep to 10 coins to two sons. And for a dad... This is the most valuable of all his assets, his son. Son gets lost. Who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to his critic, critics who are Jewish men who are criticizing him for the company he keeps. When he says a man has two sons, who do they identify with? Now, when you hear a story or a movie, you identify with somebody, don't you? So who do these guys identify with? The father, right? Father has two sons. Amazingly, one is older than the other one. <laughs> Usually happens even if they're twins. You know? <laughs> and he's, the younger one isn't just younger in years. He's younger in attitude. In some ways, he's not really grown up yet. And the son, the younger son, does not like it at home. Ever known a boy like that? <laughs> We've had th literally thousands of Mennonite kids through Bible schools in Europe. <clears throat> and many of them use it as an, an excuse to escape from home. Home is too rigid no freedom, can express themselves, let me get out of here. And so here's this younger son, doesn't like it at home. What's the home like? Well, of course, it's a Jewish home. It's a Pharisee's home. The rules are very rigid, and there's a lot of them. Not only that, though, there's an older brother. And he's not just older in years, He's older because he was never a kid. I had a sister who was never a kid. <laughs> Seven years older than me. Really good girl, so I had to be the bad one in the family to have an identity. Couldn't compete. <coughs> so the good, good guy is always obedient to his dad, always trying to help his dad, always working on the farm, always keeping the rules, no complaints about his behavior. Younger kid is bored out of his mind. Can't wait to escape. 
And then he goes past the travel agent. And in the travel agent's window are all these exotic posters of things you can do in the far country. Where does he live? In the holy country. So what is the far country? The heathen country. But it looks so good in the travel posters, doesn't it? It's called temptation. And uh, as he sees these travel posters, he thinks, wow, wouldn't it be great to go there? and <laughs> get away from this <coughs> and my annoying brother and my legalistic dad. <coughs> so eventually he hatches a plan and he's just got one problem. See, he knows now you can ha really have fun in the far country provided you've got one commodity and that is money. <laughs> and that's his problem because he doesn't have any. Dad is loaded but kid doesn't have any. So he gets to thinking, and he thinks, you know, one day my dad's going to die. And when he dies, his estate will be split between my brother and me. Of course, he'll get most because he's the older brother, but I'll still get a substantial chunk. There's only one problem with that. The old guy's in such good health. He's not going to die for years. By the time he snuffs it, I'll be so old, I won't be able to enjoy the far country. This, this is ridiculous. <coughs> so now he goes to his dad, and his suggestion is really this. Hey, dad, let's pretend you're dead. Of course, like any teenager, he's learned to put things a little more tactfully. So he says, father, he learns some King James English, father, Give to me the portion of goods that falleth to me. In other words, let's pretend you're dead and give me my bit now. And dad is too smart to think you can compel or legislate love. You can't. It has to be a free response. So he agrees with this plan, though he doesn't like it gives the kid his share of the inheritance, a lot of money. And in almost no time flat, the kid is gone. And he goes to the far country, the heathen country, and he has an amazing time. He's got lots of friends there, instant friends, uh, because he's got lots of money. But when the money runs out, the friends run out. And from his behavior in the far country, you would never think that he was the son of his father. His behavior bears no resemblance to life at home. He is the son of his father, though. This is a story about two sons. They're both related to the father. It's not an evangelistic story. <clears throat> when the money runs out, he gets hungry. Amazing how boys get hungry, isn't it? It doesn't take long. <clears throat> and now he's hungry and no man's going to give him anything because the friends he had weren't really friends. And he now has to resort to a four-letter word. It's called work. Never considered that before. Didn't like it at home. He's escaped from it here. Now he's got to work, but he's in a heathen country. And it's full of heathen people. And the only work he can get is with this guy who's maybe a bit cynical and sends him out to feed pigs. <laughs> See, now, it's not just that the pig is not the world's most socially popular animal, <coughs> except on the table, <coughs> but it's unclean for a Jew. And now this kid has got to go and spend his life among pigs. And he is therefore permanently unclean as a Jew. 
That means even if the synagogue was round the corner, he couldn't go to it. Couldn't go to the temple, couldn't offer a sacrifice. He's unclean. And he's permanently unclean because that's what he's doing all his life. And no, he's not just unclean, he's also stinky. <laughs> because pigs do that to you if you get too close to them. <coughs> and so he, here he is, and his clothes are wearing out, and he's really hungry, and nobody's giving anything. And he's getting thinner and hungrier and dirtier and more ragged and more smelly by the day. And now put yourself in the place of the guys that Jesus is talking to, right? They're wealthy Pharisees with this nice lifestyle. Uh, this could be my kid. I could well imagine my younger kid doing this because he's a bit bored at home. It isn't surprising because Pharisaic homes really are boring, let's face it. <coughs> so finally, the kid starts to do some real thinking. It's good. And he thinks, hey, this is so stupid. I'm here desperately hungry, starving to death, having a miserable time, no fun at all. The servants in my dad's house have got all they want to eat. And I've blown my opportunity of being a son, but I'm sure my dad will give me a job and I could eat. So he takes this hard decision to go back home. And of course, it's always hard to admit you've been wrong and go and seek forgiveness. But he sets off, he is very difficult to recognize from the young guy who left home. He left home in a hurry, smart new clothes, eyes on adventure, everything's going to be great now, life's going to start for me. He's coming back broken, defeated, exhausted, hardly has the energy to walk. And he's filthy and ragged, very difficult to recognize. But his dad recognizes while he's still a long way off. Why? Because he's been looking for him every day. Not for one moment has the son ceased to be a son. He didn't look like his dad's son when he was squandering large amounts of money on disgusting behavior. He didn't look much like his dad's son. Now he's dirty and smelly and in rags and exhausted. But he is. He has never stopped being a son. Not only that, but dad has never stopped being a dad. It's hard to stop being one. There isn't a switch you can turn off and say, okay, I'm not a dad any longer. Oh, good luck with that, mate. <coughs> so dad's been uh, looking for him. And remember, this is a picture of the Almighty, right? <coughs> and he does something very undignified, unthinkable in that culture. He ran. Adults did not run in that society. Nike were out of business. Nobody ran <laughs> if they were adults. The old man sees his son in the distance and runs, and the clothes weren't designed for running. They were kind of like long flowing dresses, and you try running those, and you run up the inside of the dress instead of running down the road. And he is shouting. And you can see the neighbors peering at Who's that old guy in the street? Running, shouting. This is a respectable neighbor. We don't do this here. And this is God. In his enthusiasm to get to somebody who wants to repent doesn't even understand what they're doing yet. So he runs to his son. His son is all ragged and he, he probably smells worse than the pigs by now. 
and he throws himself on his son's shoulders and hugs him, kisses him, and he's shouting instructions. The son is trying to uh, work through his little made-up prayer. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no more worthy to be caught. Bring out the best robe. Bring a ring, shoes. Kill the fattened calf. <coughs> Every wealthy farm had a fattened calf just waiting for a great occasion when they could kill it and have a real party. <coughs> and so all this is happening. <laughs> Send out the invitations, get the neighbors in, hire a dance bell. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> That's offensive to the Baptists, who won't say it. <laughs> <coughs> and they have the biggest party the district has ever seen. And this is just setting the scene, it's not the story. Now, attention shifts to a lonely figure out in the fields the older brother. And he is coming home after a day's work. And it's not until he gets near the farm that he hears music and dancing. And he thinks he's in the wrong place at first. No, this is my home. What's going on here? We don't do this. All these lights, all this music, laughter. No, this is not my home. And then he sees a servant and he says, Hey, you, what's going on here? The Romans commandeered the place of what? What's all this? And he has no idea what's happening. And the servant explains to him, why, sir, your brother's come home. Your father's celebrating. He's killed a fattened calf. It is quite a feast. I haven't seen anything like this for a long time. Better hurry up and get in there while there's still something left. And a kind of cold rage fills his heart. And he says, you can just tell my father I will not be attending. The servant relays the message to Dad, who is having such a great time. The answer to maybe years of prayer. At last, his younger son is home again. The house has come alive. His friends and neighbors are all there. They're feasting. But see, this, this dad is not guilty of favoritism. His older son is just as much a son as the kid. So he leaves the side of his newly returned son, tears himself away from all the festivities, and he goes out to meet his older son whom he loves just as much. And out in the darkness, away from the party, he confronts the lost son. The lost son is not the younger one. He's found. The older one is the lost son. He's the Pharisee. And when he asks for an explanation of his son's behavior, the son says, you have no concept of justice at all, have you? Here am I, I work my fingers to the bone about your business, your farm, never disappoint you, always obey your rules, and what do I get? Nothing. Not even one skinny, scruffy, scraggy little goat. Nothing. And this son of yours comes home. He's a great character, isn't he? 
disgraces your name in heathen cities, squanders your wealth, and he gets the biggest party the district's ever seen. You think that's fair? I don't. And he says to his son, Son, you are always with me, and all I have is yours. Ever notice that line? It's God speaking. All I have is yours. You never had a party. Why? Not one skinny, scruffy, scrawny, scraggy little goat. Why? You could have killed a calf yesterday, it's yours. So exactly what kind of a dad do you think I am? Do you think I take some kind of perverse glee in watching you drudging away, slaving away, work, 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 miserable, miserable, miserable? Do you think that satisfies my father's heart? Do you? See, the point of this story is that neither of these boys knew their dad. The younger one sees dad as an automat. Push the right button, you get what you want. Need some money, or you need to push that one. Dad only exists to give stuff. There's no relationship. He's not asking himself, what will it do to my dad if I leave home? He just wants to get away from home because he doesn't have a relationship. For the older brother, dad is just a slave driver. And these are kind of two pictures of God that two kinds of Christian have. The younger one hasn't grown up yet. He's not learned to say, Dad, is there something I could do for you today? that will bring you joy? Dad, have you got something you want to say to me that I need to listen to? Now, God is only there so he can get stuff out of him. Press the right button, say the right prayer, you'll get it. He's got plenty. And for the older brother, God is just an autocrat. You've got to do what he says all the time. No laughter, no smile, no party. And both of those are a travesty. God isn't like either of those. But neither of these boys know their dad. And that is a problem with the Pharisees that Jesus is talking to. These stories are designed to penetrate and finally bring life. As he's telling the story, they don't understand anything. But eventually, it takes root. I love teaching the Word of God because it's like a time bomb. <laughs> you just put it in there and leave it to God for when it's going to explode. But it's going to explode because that's what it is. <coughs> Other people prefer the picture of a seed, which maybe is... Uh, more biblical. <coughs> Neither of these sons nor the father. So I want to ask you a very serious question. Do you know him? How well do you know him? Yesterday we talked about Hosea marrying Gomer and went into a little bit of detail about what that was like. He loves her, she doesn't love him. She goes out, looks for somebody else, betrays him, disgraces his name, comes back sometime in the middle of the night, and he takes her back again. And he forgives her. And he loves her. And he hopes. Today, it's going to be 
different, but it isn't. Evening draws near, she's off again. And he's going through this cycle of love, of hope, of disappointment, of despair, of anger, of frustration, forgiveness, love. And the cycle is unthinkable, or is it? Two of you yesterday came to me and said, I could not do that. <laughs> well, congratulations, you got the point. <laughs> we know you couldn't do it. None of you could. You could not do this. Christian life is impossible. Some people think it's difficult. It's not difficult. It's impossible. As Hosea goes through this horrible cycle, day after day, disappointed, frustrated love, serious anger, shame in public, eventually he comes to an amazing understanding. That is exactly what God is experiencing with Israel. That God sets his love on Israel, rescues her from slavery, gives her land flowing with milk and honey, and what does she do? Turns her back on him and goes after Baal, Ashtaroth, etc., And God takes her back again and keeps loving and keeps getting wounded, keeps getting hurt. And Hosea discovers as his heart throbs with all these emotions that he's actually in tune with God. He understands now why he has a mission. It's not enough to just understand the message. Intellectually, you've got to feel it. You've got to know it. I once heard a missionary say, I have five sons. I wouldn't give any one of them for you lot. But God only had one son, and he gave him. Do you know what that proves? The missionary did not know God. He knew the message, didn't know God. Of all the men who have ever served God, who have had any impact on human history, there are two that stand out. One of them is Moses. Grows up for 40 years in the palace, has every possible advantage of education, of luxury, of opportunity, of entertainment, meets all the most significant figures in human culture. And at the age of 40, makes a calculated decision. Not only does he know life inside the palace, through the window, he can see the slaves making bricks every day under the threat of a taskmaster with a whip, living in miserable little hovels, owning nothing. And as he is there for all these years, he has the opportunity to evaluate. And here's the conclusion he came to. <coughs> it is better to be a slave, if you have to be a slave, and be right with God, 
than to be the most famous and wealthy and powerful individual in the world if you're not right with God. And at the age of 40, he made this calculated choice, I'm going to be one of them, not one of them. And many of us think we don't have to make that choice. <laughs> Can't we choose to follow God and be rich? No, you can't. If you choose to follow God, he might make you rich. He might not. Three million Hebrews say he didn't. <clears throat> but you can't choose both. Choose God, he might make you rich, might not. Choose wealth, you're rejecting God. The way Jesus put it like this, uh, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. Or on another occasion, no man can serve two masters. I don't care who you are, nobody can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Choose. Moses chose, becomes a servant of God. <coughs> He is used by God to lead three million slaves out of captivity into freedom. He has seen God do a whole series of miracles with the plagues of Egypt. He has seen God open the waters of the Red Sea and drown the world's most powerful army in a matter of minutes. Freedom. A few days later, just a few days, they come to Mount Sinai. Moses goes up the mountain. <clears throat> He's going to meet with God. God is going to initiate his marriage covenant with his nation. Moses' older brother Aaron is left in charge. What is the time frame for Israel? Well, they've been slaves 400 years, so they're not used to things moving all that fast. <clears throat> it's just a few days. But Moses is gone 40 days, and that's too long to wait. You've got to go somewhere. Hey, Aaron, you're our leader now. Has your brother got Alzheimer's? He's 80 years old. Has he forgotten what weighs down? <coughs> we can't afford to stay around here. We've got to go somewhere. You be our leader. <coughs> and this God <coughs> is too scary. He's too remote, too inaccessible. Make us a new God. So Aaron does. New God. Great. Celebration. Little alcohol. Little more alcohol. Behavior deteriorates until you've got an orgy at the bottom of the mountain. And God is up there looking at this. How long has it taken them to forget him and start worshipping a piece of metal? Not very long. Remember, God is a white-hot lover. So he says to Moses, stand back. I'm going to wipe those people out and start again with you. You will become a great nation, and all my promises and purposes will be fulfilled through you. They've had it. And Moses reasons with God and says, Hey, hey God, what's that going to do for your reputation? Doesn't matter about mine. I'm no man. Is it you? Don't do it. Not good for your reputation. How, how will Jesus put that 
Our Father who is in heaven, how's it go? Hallowed be your name. Now he comes down the mountain and now he sees what God has seen. The whole nation has gone berserk. His brother has seized his place in leadership. They're committing idolatry, which is the worst sin you can commit, and a few others that go along with it. And he is personally betrayed by his brother and the nation. If it weren't for them, he could still be in the palace. He has sacrificed all of that to become their leader and get them out of there. And in 40 days, how does that make you feel?